Before we start the podcast, we wanted to let you know about West OS. If you're a teacher or pupil at a school in Scotland, then you now have access to hundreds of quality assured video lessons created by teachers to support your remote learning. You should be able to find West OS within the app library of Glow, where you can add the tile to your own personal launchpad. Click on the tile and you'll have immediate access to stream lessons in every area of the Scottish curriculum, with video lessons already available for biology at National 5, Higher and Advanced Higher. Now let's get on with the podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Lecky Textbooks, Revision Guides and Practice Papers. Everything you need to learn, review and prepare for your SQA exams. Browse the books at www.leckyscotland.co.uk and get 40% off using the discount code LECKYPODCAST40. You can now also collect Young Scott reward points by using the codes within the description of each episode to claim discounts and rewards on their website www.young.scott. Enthuse young people to come into that area of science and to actually probably do things that old guys like me have never thought of before. In this episode, we will learn about photosynthesis with Professor Richard Cogdell, Hooker Chair of Botany at Glasgow University. Professor Cogdell, a Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, is Director of the Glasgow Biomedical Research Centre and is a past president of the International Society of Photosynthesis Research, which celebrated its 25th anniversary in summer 2020. We will discover how understanding the mechanics of photosynthesis can help solve global problems such as climate change and find out if eating carrots really can help us see in the dark. We will be referring to the SQA course specification for higher biology, and helping you to understand some of the key concepts along the way. My name is Professor Richard Cogdell. I'm the Hooker Professor of Botany at Glasgow University, and I've been there for a long time now, since 1975. And most of my research has been trying to understand the molecular mechanisms involved in photosynthesis, Recently, I was the president of the International Society for Photosynthesis Research. And as a result of the work I've done on photosynthesis, I'm also a fellow of the Royal Society. So I guess you, you've, you've gone uh, into it in a little bit more depth than you might have done when, when you were at high school, Richard. Yeah, I mean, when I uh, was at high school, I was down in England at a grammar school in Guildford in Surrey. And... Um, in those days, um, doing A-levels, you could either do botany or zoology. You couldn't do biology. So I only did zoology. So I didn't meet photosynthesis as a, a, a subject until I was at university. So it was something that captured my imagination when I was an undergraduate. And zoology, of course, focuses on animals while botany focuses on plants. Uh, yes. uh, so they, they, they made you choose quite early on then? In those days, you had to choose very quickly. I think since I've come to Scotland, I've um, realised the benefit of a more general, higher approach rather than um, A-levels. And what, what was your own favourite subject at school? My own favourite subject was chemistry. I like the part of biology which you'd probably call biochemistry. Yeah. So my degrees are in biochemistry. So I, I sit very much at the interface between chemistry and, and biology. And that's the molecular part of biology, which I find very exciting. Do you have any particular memories of secondary school and, and chemistry or, or science in general? We had a, a very talented teacher who I discovered later had um, been through the Second World War and was just excited to be alive and to be a teacher again, doing something useful rather than fighting. And he was very in inspirational. And he took us into a lot of chemistry, which is way above what we needed to do for A-level. But it was a lot of fun. So I did a lot of work on transitional metal complexes in chemistry, which are highly pigmented and coloured. And that probably got me into interested in pigments, which then took me into photosynthesis. The conversion of light energy from the sun into chemical energy through the process of photosynthesis changed the earth and life on it. I wanted to start by asking the professor about the impact photosynthesis had in evolution. It's important, I think, to realise how a big thing photosynthesis has been 
for the evolution of the planet. When photosynthesis first evolved, aerobic photosynthesis, that is water splitting photosynthesis, there was no oxygen in the environment. And when photosynthesis evolved, you find in photosynthesis, for every molecule of carbon dioxide you take in from the atmosphere, one molecule of oxygen is produced. Photosynthesis transformed the atmosphere from being 20% CO2 to being 20% oxygen and a very small amount of CO2. That oxygen did several things. First of all, it changed the geology of the planet. So it allowed it all the iron to essentially rust in the rocks. And you can see the rocks going red when photosynthesis evolved. Also, it allowed ozone to be produced in the upper atmosphere, which cut out a lot of the harmful UV irradiation. And that allowed organisms to move out of an aqueous environment into a terrestrial environment. And the presence of oxygen allowed respiration to evolve which is very efficient, and that allowed multicellular organisms to evolve. It also, because of excess photosynthesis, produced all the fossil fuels that we now so greedily consume. So really, our whole planet has been sculpted by photosynthesis. Now, we have a problem because we burn too much fossil fuels that produce CO2 in excess of what photosynthesis can refix. So the concentration of CO2 is going up, and we get in all the problems of climate change. So photosynthesis is really the only model set of reactions we have that can use solar energy, which is a huge amount of renewable energy, to actually take CO2 out of the atmosphere to recreate a fuel. We'll come back to how we can harness the process of photosynthesis to solve these types of problems. However, before we do, Let's take a closer look at the process itself, which of course starts with light energy from the sun. This light energy falls on a leaf and can be absorbed, transmitted or reflected. Light energy that is not transmitted nor reflected is absorbed by photosynthetic pigments to generate ATP for photolysis. Right, so I mean, the best way to think about photosynthesis is in terms of two separate reactions. The first reaction is where Photosynthetic organisms absorb solar energy and use that energy to drive the synthesis of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and a reductant, which is NADPH2. Um, the pigments are involved in those initial light reactions where solar energy is absorbed by the major pigments, which in higher plants are chlorophylls and carotenoids. And then in the subsequent dark reactions, the ATP and reductant are used to power the fixation of CO2 and the conversion from an oxidized compound back to reduced compound carbohydrate, and then to fuel essentially everything that we do. And and obviously, initially we start, you know, within our National 5 courses, we talk about chlorophyll being the green pigment contained within the chloroplast. But obviously at a higher level, we then begin to realize that, you know, we, we actually have chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, and those absorb most light at the blue and red ends of the visible light spectrum. Well, why is that? Um, that comes from the molecular properties of the chlorophyll molecule itself. If you look at chlorophyll, it consists of two bits. It consists of a, a ring group where magnesium is complex in the middle of it, and then a tail, which is a purely hydrocarbon non-photoactive part of the molecule. And the ring group is where all the photochemistry takes place, where the light absorption takes place and where the oxidation reduction reactions take place. And it's those chemical properties that come from that ring structure that actually result in the absorption in the blue and the absorption in the red. And so it appears green because when light hits a leaf, the blue and the red part of the spectrum are absorbed and what's reflected is a non-absorbed part, which is the green. When a pigment absorbs a photon of light, then an electron in the lowest ground state is excited to the first excited singlet state. That might be a bit complicated for you. But when it's in that excited state, then it is unstable and it lasts for a very, very short period of time. Actually, it lasts for a, about a nanosecond, which is 10 to the minus 9 of a second. And it's got to be used within that time. Otherwise, that excited electron drops back down from the excited state to the ground state, and the excess energy is lost. Now, it can be lost as fluorescence, 
which is rather like the process in the fluorescent bulb in your classroom in the ceiling, or it can be used productively for photosynthesis. And the two ways it can be used productively is that energy can be passed from chlorophyll molecule from, to chlorophyll molecule until it comes to a specialized few where it can then drive an oxidation reduction reaction and the excited electron is given away to reduce an acceptor molecule and the positive hole which was left, ultimately that's where the oxidative power to extract electrons from water comes from and why you have a water splitting reaction in the, the light reactions. That's where the oxygen comes from, by withdrawing and, electrons and protons from water. And that first stage, um, the light reaction stage, um, is often called photolysis, which, which literally translates, of course, to, to light splitting. Photolysis is a light-driven reaction, in this case, ultimately resulting in the splitting of water into oxygen, electrons and protons. So that's where the word comes from. To summarise what we need to know here, absorbed light energy excites electrons in the pigment molecule. It's the transfer of these electrons through the electron transport chain which releases energy to generate ATP by ATP synthase. Energy is also used for photolysis in which water is split into oxygen, which is released into the atmosphere, and hydrogen ions, which are transferred to the coenzyme NADP. I think your, your students will probably come across two of these cofactors, NAD and NADP. So NADH is a hydrogen carrier which is used in respiration. So when you respire molecules and you oxidize them, the reductant is, the hydrogen is stored up on NAD to produce NADH, which is then oxidized by the electron transport chain in the mitochondria to convert that reductant power into ATP. Now, NADP is used biosynthetically to power reductive reactions. So any biochemical reaction, a metabolic reaction that's building something up, an anabolic reaction, will always use NADP as the donor, NADPH, to provide the reductant. And it appears in biology there's a separation between NAD-linked redox reactions and NADP-linked redox reactions. NAD-linked are always involved in catabolism, NADP-linked ones are always involved in anabolism, which is a building up reactions rather than the breaking down reactions. It's a, it allows the cells to compartmentalize the reductant into two pools. So it can actually use one pool for oxidation and one pool for reduction without competing between those two pools. And it's that separation of those two cofactors and the specificity of the enzymes that either use one or the other that allows those two reactions to coexist in the same cell at the same time. We will learn more about respiration and both anabolic and catabolic pathways within the metabolism and survival unit of the course. For now though, let's take a little time to develop our understanding of the pigments involved in photosynthesis. Photosynthetic pigments are found in the chloroplast which is the location of the light reactions or photolysis of photosynthesis. Chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B are the two main pigments in green plants, which we can see in the absorption spectrum on page 144 of the Lecky Higher Biology student book. This shows us the different wavelengths of light absorbed by the photosynthetic pigments, including accessory pigments such as carotenoids, which extend the range of wavelengths absorbed. Carotenoids are purely hydrocarbon molecules that have a long hydrocarbon chain, which is an extended conjugated double bond system, alternating double and single bonds. And that's what gives it its strong absorption of visible radiation. Carotenoids take their name from carrots. So they're the orange pigment that you ingest when you, you eat carrots. And they serve two functions in photosynthesis. Their important function is one of photoprotection. Because if you overexcite chlorophyll molecules, one of the byproducts you can get is a long lifetime excited state, which is called carotenoid triplet state, which can react with molecular oxygen to produce harmful forms of oxygen, which will destroy not only 
photosynthesis, but the plant itself. In fact, there are some herbicides called bleaching herbicides, which inhibit carotenoid biosynthesis. And the next time the plant goes into the light and there's oxygen, they kill themselves by this harmful reaction. And carotenoids prevent that because they're able to take away those horrible, horrible triplet states to produce carotenoid triplets, which are too low in energy to convert oxygen, molecular oxygen, into a harmful form. Also, light absorbed by the carotenoids is available to be transferred to the chlorophylls, making it available for photosynthesis. And that's called accessory light harvesting, extra light harvesting. And that serves to broaden the spectrum of light which can drive photosynthesis. So carotenoids typically absorb in the green region of the spectrum. Not a lot, whereas plants wouldn't be green. But they can use that light and pass it on to the chlorophylls and make it available for photosynthesis. Now, some photosynthetic organisms, for example, diatoms, which you find in the ocean, live at a depth in the ocean where the spectrum from the solar energy has been filtered by the water, but what's left is a blue-green light. And in that situation, in that ecological niche, 95% of the light that drives their photosynthesis is first of all absorbed by the carotenoid molecules. So it depends on where the photosynthetic organism is, as to how important those two different roles of the carotenoids are. And I wonder if there's a connection between the, the carotenoid pigments and, and, and their link with carrots to this idea that you hear people talking about of carrots helping you to see in the dark. <laughs> well, you see because of retinal, a pigment in your eyes. And retinal is almost exactly half a carotenoid molecule. So you need to have carotenoids in your diet, which because we can't make them in the uh, inside our bodies. And then there are enzymes inside your body which can cut the carotenoid molecule into two bits to produce retinal, which is the pigment that actually you require to see. And so it is true that carotenoids in your diet able you to see. It's not just in the dark at night, but actually to see at all. So I guess we should be upping our intake of carrots then? Certain... Um, Diets are very low in carotenoids, and there are people in the third world who are blind because of the absence of carotenoids in their diets. And that's why a few years ago, people in Switzerland tried to produce what's called golden rice, rice where they put carotenoids into genetically, to try to allow um, those countries where they have a high rice-based diet but not much carotenoids to actually repair their ability to produce retinal and so allow their children to see again. And they would have done that through some form of process of genetic engineering? Yes, it works, but then you get into problems of people being scared of genetic engineering. So it hasn't um, been rolled out as much as it should be because of those problems. The company that produced them will give golden rice free of charge to the countries that need it. But it's persuading some of those countries to actually accept it that is the problem. It, it's very strange to think about it in that way, but it, that, that is true. And you would think, though, that something like the golden rice would have to go through quite strict control measures and trials before, before they were able to even consider doing that. And, and they've done that, and it's, it's perfectly safe. And do you have, a, do you have an opinion on, on kind of the genetic modification of kind of foods and stuff? Because that seems like, a, to me, to be a, a really wonderful, you know, solution to a horrible problem. I, I think that when it was first being done, the examples that some of the companies like Monsanto did weren't very clever. And the technology that they used was also not very clever. Now you can do that engineering without using antibiotic resistance cartridges to get the selective breeding. You can do it um, <clears throat> in, in a way that doesn't involve those sort of things which are dangerous. And you can do it in a way where you can do it in plants which are only inbreeders, not outbreeders. And so you can do these things safely now. It's a question of doing it for the right reasons rather than doing it just to make a company a lot of money. Mm, yeah, and I think if it's done wisely, then I think it's going to be very important. We've had the green revolution very much because of people learning how to 
breed plants successfully to increase productivity of things that we require for food, for example. But we've almost reached the limit of what we can do, but there are still millions of people who are starving. And so if we stop ourselves being able to put foreign genes in to improve productivity and to pr uh, improve resistance to various pests and diseases, then I think we are limiting ourselves in a way which will have severe consequences for lots of people in the world. Although genetic engineering may provide substantial benefits in areas such as biomedical science and food production, the creation and use of genetically engineered animals and plants may raise ethical issues which must be considered. Science does unquestionably, however, hold the answers to many major global problems, providing that we ask the correct questions and understand the necessary detail. So the question that we've been looking at is to see, can we learn from photosynthesis how to do this so that we could actually use solar energy as a, a large source of energy that's available to us to actually replicate that reaction of reducing atmospheric CO2 to produce a fuel. And what we've been trying to understand is what natural reactions some strange bacteria can do to actually give us a chemical blueprint of something we might be able to engineer to produce fuel completely renewable so that if you burn the fuel you produce CO2 and then you can refix that CO2 into new fuel so you could get back the atmosphere into balance again and we're at the beginning of that sort of work but I'm encouraged because photosynthesis works photosynthesis does this so and biology isn't magic it doesn't it does everything by the normal rules of physics and chemistry. And if we are clever enough to understand that and to replicate it, maybe we can contribute to a renewable source of energy that will be clean. Not that we won't be producing CO2, but we'll be producing CO2 and refixing it in a one-to-one -one ratio and therefore bring everything back into balance. So that's the dream that we have. And it's trying to understand the molecular mechanisms of the natural process well enough to allow us to replicate it. Photosynthesis didn't evolve for us to use as a source of energy. Photosynthesis evolved to allow plants to grow and reproduce. And in that regard, it's very successful, but it's not energetically very efficient per se. If you look at, at a crop growing, let's say in a field in Scotland, the overall efficiency of utilization of solar energy is less than 1%. So if you were gonna use photosynthetic organisms as they are to actually produce a fuel, you'd need to harvest the solar energy over such a large part of the surface of the earth, there wouldn't be room for us to live, to grow food or anything else. A friend of mine from Holland calculated that the current rates of efficiency of producing so-called biofuels, you'd have to have the whole surface area of Holland, the whole surface area of Belgium, most of Denmark and part of Germany just to provide what Holland needs and that will be without anywhere for any Dutchman to live. So it puts it into context of what we're up against that if we could actually use those molecular mechanisms to, to make chemical catalysts which we could get to work at the efficiency required then you've got the ability to use solar energy which is very abundant there's lots of it there's Enough solar energy hits the surface of the earth every hour to power all of mankind's needs for a year. So it's a huge resource if we could actually learn how to use it. And this is what we're trying to discover. At higher level, we must be able to describe the various stages in carbon fixation, including the roles of Rubisco and RUBP. This set of reactions may sometimes be referred to as the Calvin cycle, after the American biochemist Melvin Calvin, who discovered the cycle alongside Andrew Benson and James Bassam. Right, so I mean, I, I think right at the beginning, I explained that the light reactions use solar energy to make ATP and reductant. Uh, those reactions take place in the membrane of the, the thylakoid membrane inside the chloroplast, and the subsequent dark CO2 fixation reactions take place in the stroma, in the, the water-soluble phase inside the inner part of the chloroplast. And that cycle of enzymes that does that is called the Calvin-Basham cycle because it was discovered by a man called Melvin Calvin and he got the Nobel Prize for that. Actually, I'm old enough to, 
to remember him and I knew him quite well. He was quite an interesting man to, oh, to wow. speak what, to. Why, why have we moved away from the, the Calvin cycle? Because certainly I remember being at school and university and referring to it as the Calvin cycle. Uh, I, I don't know. Fashions change. I don't think either's right or wrong. It's just a change in fashion. Uh, what, what can you tell us about Calvin himself? Calvin was a very clever chemist and he was an interesting man, quite, um, quite an aggressive man, interestingly. Um, but he was lucky because he was working in Berkeley at the time when Berkeley developed one of the first synchrotrons. And so he could get his hands on an isotope of carbon called carbon-14. And he was able to do a very clever experiment, which was to incubate an algae in the presence of carbon-14 CO2, start the reaction by a flash of light, and look to see where that labelled carbon went into the carbohydrate molecules inside the algae. So if you can imagine that CO2 being taken up and being reduced and started to be converted into a carbohydrate, he was able to follow that reaction, the time course of that reaction, first of all, to find all the molecules which were labelled, which became radioactive, and then to work out from that what the metabolic pathway must be that is the CO2 fixation pathway that we now understand. And it's an interesting pathway because it first, the first enzyme, I don't know what, do you call it Rubisco? Yep. This was the, the most important enzyme that evolved in photosynthesis because this is the one that allows you to convert CO2 into a carbohydrate by adding it to the acceptor molecule so that you start off with a five carbon acceptor and add one. And the first labeled compound that Calvin found was actually a C3 molecule So what happens is that C5 becomes C6 and then is split into two threes. And then those threes are reduced and used to regenerate C5 compounds so the whole cycle can go again. And when you've been around the cycle enough, you can bleed off some of those C3 molecules, join them together to form a C6 glucose, and you can then start to store away that stored carbon. So it's a, a regenerative cycle. It's a carboxylation, there's reduction, and then there's regeneration of the chemical reactions occurring in that cycle. Interestingly, the enzyme Rubisco has two serious faults. One, it doesn't have a very high efficient affinity for carbon dioxide. It evolved the time when carbon dioxide was 20% of the atmosphere. And now it has to struggle with CO2 concentrations of 0.04% in the atmosphere. And so actually you have to have lots and lots and lots of Rubisco in a chloroplast to get enough activity to fix CO2. In fact, Rubisco is the most abundant protein on the planet by far. It's, it's such high concentration in some plants that it crystallizes out within the chloroplast. It also has an unfortunate reaction with molecular oxygen so that approximately one third of the fixed carbon is lost in an oxygenase reaction and goes back into the atmosphere. And so it it not only works poorly, but part of its inherent reaction actually recreates CO2 and a third of the fixed carbon is actually lost. And this is one of the major reasons why plant photosynthesis is rather inefficient. C4 plants like sugarcane and certain uh, cyanobacteria have evolved ways to try to overcome that and make that more efficient. But higher, but the, the normal crop plants that we have, uh, barley and wheat and those sort of things, uh, have this problem with this defective enzyme. I call it defective, but... It's far better than any chemical catalyst that mankind has learned how to make yet. There are catalysts that can be made that will activate atmospheric CO2, but only where it's essentially almost 100% of the atmosphere that you use, only in the absence of oxygen and only at elevated temperatures. So although Rubisco is not very good, it works under extremely low abundant conditions of CO2, 
And so it's quite a remarkable enzyme. Uh, and the acceptor molecule we talked about um, would be RUBP, which is ribulose biphosphate. What, what could you tell us about that? It's a sugar molecule and it contains two phosphate groups. That's why it's called bisphosphate. And when the CO2 is added and you then get two C3 carbon atoms, uh, three phosphoglyceric acid, the phosphate is separated into both of those. And most sugar metabolism takes place when the sugar molecules are activated by having phosphate groups associated with them. And so that's where that molecule comes from. And then it has to be regenerated again, as I said, in order to get the cycle to work again. Yeah, and so that, the, that three phosphoglycerate molecule, that, that, that's then transformed into glyceraldehyde three phosphate before, yeah. before it goes to ribulose yeah, so it, phosphate. It, it's, in chemistry, if you reduce an acid, you can get an aldehyde. And that's the three phosphoglyceric acid is reduced to three phosphoglyceraldehyde. And that's where the reduction of the oxidized CO2 is taking place. And obviously at that point, then the glucose is released as a six carbon sugar um, and the ribulose biphosphate goes back around again in, yep. in a cycle. Yeah. Well, it goes around as ribulose 5-phosphate. And in the final stage of that regeneration, it's converted to ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. So the phosphorylation to get the activated acceptor with the two phosphate groups is the last step of the regeneration before the, the next carboxylation reaction takes place. And, and these biosynthetic pathways, they, they lead to the, form, the formation of a variety of metabolites, such as DNA, protein, fats? Yes, so that all of metabolism, to get it to go in the direction that you want, requires an input of energy. Ultimately, in cells that come from ATP, but also you need the source of carbon as the skeleton to actually provide the, the molecules that you need. So that from sugars, you can get both the skeletons that you need and the energy in the form of ATP. Because although we all think of plants as, as growing by photosynthesis, that's true, but they're able then to respire that carbohydrate just as we do to produce the energy in the mitochondrion which then powers their metabolism to drive the synthesis of all the molecules you require to, to build a cell. To summarise this part of the process then, the enzyme Rubisco fixes carbon dioxide by attaching it to RUBP. The 3 phosphoglycerate or 3PG for short, which is produced, is then phosphorylated by ATP and combined with hydrogen ions from NADPH to form glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or G3P for short. G3P is used to regenerate RUBP and for the synthesis of glucose. The glucose may then be used as a respiratory substrate, synthesized into starch or cellulose, or passed to other biosynthetic pathways, which can lead to the formation of a variety of metabolites such as DNA, protein and fat. Within the National 5 course, we learned that carbon dioxide concentration, light intensity and temperature are limiting factors due to their impact on photosynthesis and plant growth. At higher level within the food supply key area, we understand that all food production is dependent ultimately upon photosynthesis. Professor Cogdell went on to explain how we came to understand these limiting factors and their impact on photosynthesis. So this, these, these go back to experiments actually done by a man called Blackman, who was a professor of, I guess, botany in, in Cambridge at the beginning of the 20th century. And he investigated the temperature and the light intensity dependence of photosynthesis. So he set up situations where in the plant he was looking at, which was a water weed, if you had light as the limiting factor and there was excess CO2, then photosynthesis overall was temperature independent. And that's because the light reactions tend to be temperature independent reactions. If he set up where there was excess light and there was limiting amounts of carbon dioxide, then the overall reaction of photosynthesis were temperature dependent. And so he was the first person to suggest that you could divide photosynthesis into light dependent, temperature independent reactions. 
and CO2 fixation, dark reactions, which were temperature dependent. We now realize because photochemical reactions tend to be temperature independent, why that is for the light reactions, and also because enzymatic reactions are temperature dependent, and the dark reactions are all enzymatic, and the light reactions tend to be driven by light and are not enzymatic and are therefore temperature independent. So this idea of limiting factors goes all the way back to the early 1900s. And this very clever man, Blackman. Now, that was at the beginning of the time when people started to study photochemical reactions. At the beginning of the time when people started to understand there were things called enzymes, although they didn't know what they were in those days. Uh, but he knew that uh, scientific information. And so he was able to use that even although the details weren't available to him, to actually have those fundamental understanding of photosynthesis in terms of the light and dark, temperature independent, temperature dependent parts of the reaction. Very clever man. Mm. Before we finished, I was interested to hear a little bit more about the Photosynthesis Society and how Professor Cogdale believes that a deeper understanding of photosynthesis can help us in tackling those big global issues we are all becoming more aware of. The Photosynthesis Society is there to actually promote an understanding of the molecular mechanisms involved in photosynthesis. It's relatively easy to explain the overall reactions without giving any details. So that light energy is used to drive the synthesis of ATP and reductant and ATPH. And then those are used in dark reactions to actually synthesize carbohydrates from atmospheric carbon dioxide. But what you really want to know is the real molecular details of all the machinery required to do this. And the reason for that is, first of all, because it's such an important basic biological process, we should understand it. But also because it accomplishes such an amazing thing, as we were talking about before, if we were able to mimic it or replicate it for our own needs to produce renewable energy, then we do a lot to um, reduce climate change. So that the re resulting photosynthesis, the society is actually dedicated to promoting the detailed research, trying to understand the molecular mechanisms, and then to go on to use that understanding, both in terms of let's say, trying to develop new ways to produce fuels cleanly, but also to allow us to improve the overall efficiency of plants. Because as we were talking before, it would be very nice to be able to increase the efficiency of growing plants for food so that then we'd be able to make more food in the same bit of land uh, as we do now and feed more people. And so <clears throat> the understanding is not only important from the point of view of understanding a basic biological process, but the application of the understanding for food production, for fuel production, and probably for other things which I don't understand at the moment, is very important. And what the society does is it not only comes together every three years at a large international meeting where we exchange ideas, we exchange knowledge, we keep each other up to date, but it also allows us to um, infuse young people to come into that area of science and to actually probably do things that old guys like me have never thought of before. I finished up by asking Professor Cogdell what message he would want to give young people studying science today. Believe that if you do well, that you'll be able to not only do well at school, but do well at university and be able to go into research and to ask and answer the questions that excite you. What's important when you do science is to really be trying to tackle important questions. And then you have to be brave enough to follow the science where those questions take you, even if it takes you out of your comfort zone. 
And then you'll find that when you do that sort of science, you can't do it by yourself. You have to do it with friends. So you have to find a network of colleagues who ultimately you have to become friends with and enjoy working with. And as an international team, then you can start to tackle these big questions. I can give you another example. Um, for a number of years, I've been determining the molecular structure of some of the pigment protein complexes which um, catalyze the light harvesting reactions. And this has involved learning how to do X-ray crystallography, where you crystallize the protein, put it into an X-ray beam, get a diffraction pattern, and from that, you can determine the three-dimensional structure. Now, that was scary enough. But when you work with some of the proteins I work with, it's not possible to get good crystals, and so you can't do it. But in the past three or four years now, a technique called single particle cryo EM, low temperature electron microscopy, has allowed you to look at individual molecules and determine molecular structure from those individual molecules. Something that 10 years ago I wouldn't have dreamt was, was possible. And we've just working with um, a colleague who now works for a company that produces the detector that's used in these electron microscopes. The first uh, structure of one of these light harvesting complexes using cryo-EM. So again, it's keeping your eye on the question you want to answer and then being aware enough to see developments in the field. It may not be in your field, but developments in all sorts of techniques you can apply to biology and then being able to find the, the right people to work with to actually do this. And that's, that's really exciting. It's an amazing thing to, to think about. Special thanks go to Professor Cogdell for exploring photosynthesis with us and even sharing his thinking on our ongoing research into having baked beans hot or cold. I actually like them both ways. Wow, it's cold, cold baked beans in a salad is nice. With the sauce? Yeah, absolutely. That. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your preferred platform and follow us on Twitter at Biology Higher. You can get 40% off all Lecky textbooks, revision guides, and practice papers using the discount code Lecky Podcast 40 online at www.leckyscotland.co.uk.